All right, well, we're going to continue with lecture number six, or 6A, this will probably be. Uh, caffeine and nicotine is the next topic up. Today we're going to talk specifically about caffeine, and then next up we'll talk about nicotine. Uh, caffeine, of course, is the most widely consumed psychoactive drug on the planet. Uh, so we'll first do an introduction to caffeine, talk about the pharmacokinetics of caffeine, caffeine, talk about the mechanism of action, and then finally finish up with tolerance and dependence. Caffeine is, as I said, the most widely used psychoactive substance in the world. It's used daily by approximately 80% of the adult population in the United States. Caffeine was first isolated from coffee in 1820 by a German chemist who called it café base. The word caffeine was first used in a metal medical dictionary in 1823. So when it comes to psychoactive substances, this one's a relatively new player in the field. Certainly if we compare it to alcohol, which had been uh, widely used by uh, Western civilization uh, for thousands of years. So um, we have just start to understand caffeine in the 19th century. Of course, it had been used prior to that, uh, but uh, we finally start to get an understanding of it in the uh, 19th century, although it had certainly been used long before that. To give you an idea of the caffeine content in some beverages, black tea and brewed coffee have the highest uh, levels of caffeine. Uh, green tea has relatively low levels of caffeine. Instant and decaf coffee have very low, much lower levels of caffeine compared to brewed coffee. Not all brewed coffee is the same. Some uh, types of coffee have higher levels of caffeine than others. Uh, sodas have relatively low levels of caffeine, even those that, uh, such as Jolt and Surge and Mountain Dew, which are uh, contain higher levels of caffeine. Uh, compared to coffee, they're relatively low levels of caffeine. All chocolate has some modest caffeine levels in them, uh, so certainly hot chocolate and hot cocoa have uh, some caffeine in them. Uh, Tablets, caffeine tablets such as Vibran, contain about 200 milligrams of caffeine, so a little more than a cup of coffee, say a cup and a half. And then your average espresso drink has about 70 milligrams of, of uh, caffeine, so relatively low levels compared to brewed coffee. So a low dose of caffeine would be somewhere around 50 to 300 milligrams of caffeine. This will increase alertness, energy, and ability to concentrate. Caffeine will relax your bronchioles, increase gastric secretions and urinary output. It's one of the reasons why um, caffeine can be quite dehydrating. So if you consume a lot of caffeine, you're going to want to consume uh, some water along with that to prevent dehydration. Moderate consumption would be uh, rarely any sort of health risk. Um, so when we start getting into higher doses, you know, more than say 1,000 milligrams a day or you know, more than 500 milligrams a day even, depending on your own uh, tolerance. This can produce anxiety, restlessness, insomnia, tachycardia in some sensitive people. So really, you want to stay in the low to moderate dose range. Everyone's tolerance is a little bit different. We're going to talk about caffeine overdoses here in a little bit when we talk about caffeine powder, which is kind of an emerging problem uh, uh, in the uh, era of internet marketplaces when you can order things like caffeine powder. In terms of the epidemiology of caffeine consumption, uh, coffee varies across countries. It's high in the Scandinavian countries in the United States, not surprising. Varies across different types of preparation, anywhere from 20 to 175 milligrams per cup, depending on the beans and the roast, etc. Um, so if you look at the kinds of coffee beans, uh, Arabica beans have about half as much caffeine as a Robusta ca um, type of beans. Most flavored coffees and milder coffees are brewed from Arabica beans and more uh, darker roasts come from Robusta coffee. Uh, other consumption comes from tea, cocoa, candy bars, soft drinks, and the average intake of a user is about 170 to 300 milligrams a day. So that's about an average user. Pharmacokinetics of caffeine, of course, we're talking about uh, GI absorption. It's about 99% in 45 minutes, so that's pretty fast and very complete. You reach uh, peak plasma levels about 120 minutes after ingestion, so it takes about two hours uh, for that caffeine to kick in. Half-life of the metabolic half-life of caffeine in adults is pretty variable. Um, it's around three and a half to five hours in adult humans. It's 60 to 100 hours in infants. Uh, 
Uh, so much slower in infants, and it's also a little bit uh, slower in older adults as well. And so you tend to get longer lasting effects of caffeine, uh, and so older adults tend to need to uh, discontinue caffeine earlier in the day. Um, caffeine metabolism is reduced by about 30 to 50 percent in smokers, so it's much, much slower. Uh, and it is actually doubled in women on oral contraceptives, and it's also prolonged during the last trimester of pregnancy. In fact, women are usually encouraged from reducing or eliminating caffeine altogether during pregnancy. Caffeine is metabolized uh, into three different end products, uh, theophylline, paroxetine, and theobromine. Uh, the, these are, caffeine is metabolized by, of course, the cytochrome P450. It's a cytochrome P1A2 subgroup of hepatic enzymes. The two major metabolites are theophylline and paroxetine, behave similarly to caffeine, and the third metabolite, theobromine, does not. Some SSRI type antidepressants inhibit the enzyme, um, while other types do not. So that's something to keep in mind. How does caffeine work? Well, um, caffeine exerts its influence by antagonizing adenosine. Adenosine is generally a um, inhibitory neurotransmitter. So caffeine antagonizes two types of adenosine receptors, A1 and A2A. In mice that do not have A2A receptors, caffeine only has a depressant, not a stimulant effect on activity. So these two receptors together are how caffeine exerts its influence. The positive effects of caffeine, so the alertness, increases in attention, appears to be due to the antagonism of adenosine receptors that normally act on GABA neurons to inhibit dopamine release. So removal of that GABAergic inhibition increases dopamine release, increases that feeling of awareness, alertness, attention, that sort of thing. Coffee has, uh, or caffeine has a number of beneficial effects. So if you look at coffee consumption associations, uh, you get reduced concentrations of inflammatory markers, reduced stroke risk, improved glucose metabolism and insulin secretion, and significantly reduced risk for type 2 diabetes, reduced cancer risk, improved headache relief, decreased risk for some diseases, increased subjective arousal, improved physical endurance and concentration, and we're going to talk here in a little bit about how caffeine is a major component of most pre-workouts. Uh, you get reduced fatigue. Uh, increased secretion of gastric acids. It's one of the reasons why sometimes coffee or caffeine can have um, some negative gastric effects. It, it can be positive, uh, but certainly if you're someone who's prone to uh, having stomach difficulties, that can be problematic. Uh, but certainly it gets things moving down there. Um, and uh, you get increased urinary output. Again, this um, caffeine has um, some diuretic effects. So, uh, in fact, a lot of diuretics are made entirely from caffeine. And then finally, you get bronchial relaxation. In fact, some um, bronchial medications contain caffeine. Adverse effects of caffeine um, for those who consume more than 12 cups per day or about a gram and a half of caffeine, so 1,500 milligrams, uh, you can get agitation, anxiety, tremors, rapid breathing, and, uh, of course, insomnia. A lethal dose is estimated at about 10 grams taken orally, which is about 100 cups of coffee. So you don't get this kind of overdose from coffee. Um, but death is usually due to convulsions and respiratory collapse. Uh, there have been six deaths uh, in humans from this uh, kind of lethal dose uh, in recent times. Um, more recently, caffeine powders have come on the market, and these products are essentially 100% caffeine, and a single teaspoon of pure caffeine is roughly equivalent to the amount in 28 cups of coffee. And so here's where you start to get into the potential for overdose. So the 10 grams taken orally is, um, of, at the lethal dose, is um, 50 vibrant tablets. Um, but if you look at this caffeine powder, we're talking about four teaspoons. And that's where you can get danger. And so that's something to be very, very careful of uh, and something to watch out for. Caffeine uh, has some other what we call caffeinism effects. At doses above 1,000 milligrams a day, you start to get some serious effects, delirium, excitement, 
ringing in the ear, flashes of light, low-grade fever, chilliness, flushing, insomnia, irregular heartbeat, loss of appetite. It looks a lot like anxiety disorder, uh, but does not respond to tranquilizers. The treatment then is just simply to eliminate caffeine. Uh, and I do want to take a s quick note about uh, pre-workouts. Uh, most pre-workouts contain pretty significant amounts of caffeine, so if that's something that you're taking, you want to watch your caffeine intake uh, when you take those because you can get pretty jittery, you can get some anxiety, uh, and I think it's something that's well known in people who take those kind of supplements. So uh, follow this link uh, and you can uh, take a look at some uh, information about how much caffeine might be in your workout supplement. So the most concerning adverse effects of caffeine is our effects on sleep. Sleep is incredibly important to us, uh, and so disruption of sleep is incredibly unhealthy. It's bad for our health. It's bad for our cognitive abilities. So it may impair the duration of quality of sleep, quality of our sleep, and cause repeated awakenings. Uh, and the other most concerning effect, adverse effect of caffeine, aside from keeping us awake, is that combination with energy drinks and alcohol that I mentioned previously. Um, people who are consuming alcohol and caffeine together increase their sexually risky behaviors. They tend to get in more fights. They're more likely to engage in prescription drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and cigarette smoking. So that combination really is something to be avoided. So how does caffeine disrupt sleep? Well, caffeine acts primarily by blocking all subtypes of the adenosine receptors, A1, 2A, 3, and 2B. Adenosine levels usually increase during the day and exert a sleep-inducing effect in the brain. So as we get further into the day, we get you know, closer to sleep. And as a result, by blocking the adenosine receptors, caffeine promotes wakefulness by blocking that effect. Caffeine may produce some behavioral effects by removing the negative modulatory effects of adenosine from dopamine receptors, so thereby indirectly stimulating dopaminergic activity. So you do get some reinforcing effects of caffeine because of that dopaminergic activity. I say as I take another sip of my coffee. So <laughs> caffeine can be uh, fairly rewarding. It's certainly something um, that can, while well, it can disrupt sleep, it uh, does have some positive uh, behavioral effects. Things to watch out for are caffeine tolerance and dependence. Uh, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, has listed uh, some potential caffeine disorders or caffeine-related disorders, which include caffeine intoxication, caffeine withdrawal, and other caffeine-induced disorders. And the treatment for these is, of course, simply um, stopping caffeine. People can become addicted to caffeine or physically addicted. Individuals often become dependent on caffeine. Uh, our median daily intake of about 360 milligrams uh, is what most people take. 40% of the population takes less than 300 milligrams. The withdrawal symptoms of, from caffeine dependence include headache, tiredness, lack of concentration, anxiety, irritability, increased muscle tension, depression, and even nausea and vomiting. Headache is probably the number one complaint of caffeine withdrawal. And one of the things that happens is uh, caffeine has an effect on uh, vasodilation in the brain. And in fact, some headache remedies, including Excedrin, contain a pretty high dose of caffeine to try to treat headache. And so that's one of the things that you want to watch out for. And then, of course, tiredness and lack of concentration. This will resolve after a few days uh, once you get back to normal if you don't consume any more caffeine. And again, this is not necessarily related to the quantity of caffeine that one might use. Um, it's to whatever dose you're, you're used to using, uh, you can become dependent on. Some effects of caffeine become tolerant in humans, things like increases in blood, blood pressure and heart rate, and increases in adrenaline and nor noradrenaline levels, anxiety, nervousness, extra energy. Uh, all those eventually become tolerant too, and we don't actually get that effect from the caffeine anymore. Uh, some effects that do not show tolerance, caffeine-induced alertness and wakefulness, uh, cerebral energy metabolism, that is our brain increases its metabolic rate. It's one of the reasons why caffeine helps us think more clearly. Caffeine has some reinforcing qualities. Human subjects can discriminate caffeine from placebo in coffee or capsules. So we can tell the difference between coffee that contains decaf or not. Doses of 300 milligrams or more are most reliably detected, but some people can detect caffeine at much lower doses.
Caffeine is not a powerful reinforcer in animals self-administering intravenously, so it doesn't have that kind of reinforcing property of cocaine. But reinforcement does vary with dose. Intake is strongly related to avoiding withdrawal. Caffeine releases dopamine in the brain, but not in that specific pleasure site. That is, it doesn't release dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, accumbens, so it's not reinforcing like cocaine is. But it does release dopamine in the brain area related to movement in the frontal cortex, which is thought to be related to attention and concentration. So it is rewarding in some sense, but not directly rewarding by activating that reward pathway. So that is our quick lecture.